But today you're at the workshop for writing IEP goals for students with functional supports and extensive support needs. I want to thank you all for being here today. And I'm very happy to be here today. Um, thank you for investing in your students and in yourselves. Just a little blurb about me. I've been in the field of working with students with extensive support needs for over 20 years. And I've been at DCN for almost two years. And what I like to do in my spare time is garden. Um, it's a nice way for me to stay decompressed and enjoy the outdoors. And we'll be together approximately well, until about 1.30 today. I'm not sure if, any, if everyone's been to the first seminar we had a few weeks ago, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and give you a little information about the Diagnostic Center so you have a little bit of background history. The Diagnostic Center is part of, is under the California Department of Education. We have three different offices. I am part of DCN North, this Diagnostic Center North, and we are located, our office is actually in Fremont. And if you can see that image um, on the screen there, the green part is all Northern California, and that's the area that we represent. In the central, DCC Central, the location of their office is Fresno, and they represent all the middle area of California, the central part. And lastly, our third office is DC South, and their office is in Los Angeles. And they represent all of Southern California there, as you see. So we have three separate offices, but we represent the whole of California. <clears throat> so we are Diagnostic Center North, DCN. And we serve over 400 school districts in Northern California, as you saw in that map. Right, the first all that talk. We provide many resources. Uh, we provide transdisciplinary assessments to students ages three to 22 that have an, um, typically have an IEP who belong in special education. We also provide training and consultation to districts. Oops. And all of this is with no cost to families or LEAs. And I'd like to go ahead and put, while I, I mentioned the Diagnostic Center, our website is going to be in the chat there. If you want to open that up and peruse one time, they, so you can see what we offer in reference to trainings. We have, asked a special, we have so many opportunities to go virtual now that there's many um, opportunities to take classes and courses. And so I sent in the chat the web page so you can look at what type of courses we're offering right now. And also different districts could um, resource us for trainings. So that's something to keep in mind and bring up with your districts if you're ever interested. And again, it is no cost to families or LEAs. And so today, as we all know, it's virtual. So we're gonna be doing a little bit of chat, some polls, um, I'm going to ask for you to engage with me a little bit because I'm not sure what you're seeing. So I'm going to make sure I get the thumbs up and the thumbs down to kind of give me some confirmation of what's happening out there. And the microphones, if you notice, is turned off. If you want to speak up, just hit your tab bar or you can go ahead and turn on your mic to say something. Uh, nothing at the chat, please send red. OK, uh, let's see. Um, so actually, I did send that. the. Website, let me try that website one more time. Copy. Let's see if that'll go through. And if, so, if you guys could get me a thumbs up, if you guys saw that Padlet link in the, the chat, great. I'm gonna go ahead and send it one more for those people that are dropping in. So, there we go. Great. All right, and so this is what your Padlet, once you hit that um, the web browser, this is what you're gonna see in the Padlet. And again, there's different sections. So again, the Goal Symposium has been like a three week process for DCN. The first um, major Goal Symposium was actually two weeks ago. 
and there was over 400 co colleagues of all, everyone came in and was able to learn a little bit about um, writing goals for all different areas of education. And so on this Padlet, you're going to see all of those pad, um, references for all the different sections of education. And then last week, we actually did a hands-on one where we actually did breakout groups and everyone got to um, participate in writing some goals. And then this week, we have a whole week. Every day, we actually have our own breakouts for different groups. And I'll, at the end of this, I'll be showing those links just in case you don't have Excuse me, Michelle, we're yes. not seeing the Padlet link or the website link. Everyone. Aha, I see why. Thank you so much for saying something. I appreciate that. I had it to only to the people in the, in the waiting room for some reason. <laughs> That's not good. I'm glad they have it. <laughs> there's, there you go. There's one. Here's another one coming for the Padlet. All right. There we go. All right, so here's today's agenda. We're gonna be focusing on foundational skills, discrete analysis, goal writing, and we're gonna do a case review study together and we'll do a review and a wrap up today. So instead of me telling you what I want you to learn, I wanna know what you wanna to learn today so that way I could Focus in on areas of interest, and you can walk away with something you can apply today or tomorrow. Okay, so I'm going to throw up a poll and go ahead and make a selection. And if it's not of the selections that are there, press other. We're going to open up the mic for people to just kind of shout out some of the things that they're hoping to gain from this. And again, so that way I could um, be a little bit more focused on your interests. All right, I think we're oops, st still climbing. Almost everyone's uh, gotten their vote in there. Some people are throwing it in the chat, what um, they wanted to be focusing on. And I am writing that down just so you guys know what I'm doing here. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing Ask a Specialist the end of May. And so it's always important to know what other people would like to learn a little bit more about. All right, here we go. Okay, let's see, is it moving up a little? We've got 39, 46, excellent. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end that polling. And I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to see the results, so I'm gonna tell you right now. 79% uh, said they want to, how to implement functional goals with academic goals. 3% wanna, how to write SMART goals. 20% at how to apply the standards to the goals. And we had some in the chat, if you guys wanted to read those. And let's see, share results. I'm gonna share, the, share those results. Give me a thumbs up if you guys could see those results. Great, thank you for being active and participating. 
All right, so there's the results. Great, so we're gonna how to implement functional goals with academic goals. And I think that's really the big concern is, you know, we need to make sure we're following the state standards and you, we can, it's, 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 that it is possible. Excellent. Michelle? Yes. Um, the reason I wrote that I'd like to make my goals more gen ed friendly is as the schools are going more towards the inclusion model, it's, um, I want my goals to be functional, uh, CCS standards, academic, but also easy to do in a gen ed classroom so I don't embarrass the student, the student doesn't feel inadequate. Thank you. Thank you for expanding on that. Thank you. And at any point that I, um, I'm not addressing your, your questions or concerns as you would like, please feel free to email me and I'll be more than happy to have a conversation with you and to kind of brainstorm ideas. I'm definitely open to those um, op options, okay? We're gonna go ahead and move forward. All right, so here we go. Why are we writing our goals, right? Well, that's the big question, right? So typically we all wanna write the goals to make sure those students are independent, right? We wanna make sure those students are becoming independent because once you find that independence, you start to feel a little bit more proud and empowered. And that means you're gonna be learning a little bit more because you want to and you can. And also people believe in you. We wanna make sure our students are having a productive time on when they're in school, either it is virtual or on site. And we wanna make sure we give those students an opportunity to excel. And by doing that again, is that we're pushing them forward. And lastly, we wanna make sure we're triangulating our goals so that way our students have more opportunities to generalize. And this generalization isn't just, you know, from one classroom to another, this is actually community-wise. Let's bring those, school, those skills to home, to the community. So what, what goals do we write? We wanna focus on functional foundation skills that build independence. And I'm gonna emphasize independence a lot is because I, many of us might be in um, elementary, but we also, those students eventually will go to high school and then go into the community. So we wanna think long-term, it's a mapping process from here to there. It's not just, okay, we're in elementary, done, moving along, we gotta think about the big picture. And so that's why I'm gonna emphasize independence a lot. And also independence is gonna give you that confidence. <clears throat> so teaching foundational skills. Foundational skills are a com com combination of functional skills and concepts that are typically taught kindergarten through second grade that provide independence. What that really looks like is our sight words, um, our foundational math skills, shapes, colors, calendar skills, independent skills, which is inclusive of hygiene and eating, right? Feeding, all of that is independent skills. So those are the foundational skills we wanna think of for all of our students to begin with. And also I didn't mention, but independence skills are also self-advocacy skills. Again, you wanna build that confidence so that way our students can say voice their needs and also understand being safe. Foundational functional skills are important and can be taught to students with significant learning needs, especially through meaningful relevant tasks and curriculum for the, that student. But before we can identify the foundational functional skills, it is important to, discrete, to do a discrete assessment to further determine areas of need. <clears throat> So here is a list of reasons to do discrete analysis assessments. So people are like, oh, we've got our standardized assessment. Standardized assessment is good and it's great, but sometimes discrete assessment is gonna give you a little bit more detail to understand what the next step is. And the next step is very individual for each student. Each student is different. So some of the reasons we would do it is to understand why is a student failing maybe in math, standardized assessment, says he can't do, he's low. Well, maybe you bring that student to your classroom and you do an assessment, just watch them do the math and you're realizing, well, it's not that you can't do the math, 
problem is you can't see the map, right? And so some of, some of those assessments that you're gonna do is gonna give you an opportunity to go a little bit deeper and try to understand and analyze what the situation is. So here are some different types of discrete analysis assessments. I'm not gonna read them off and it's not an, the end all. There's a lot of different assessments out there. I mean, you don't have to use a full battery of assessments when you get them. You could use some of the subtests. I personally like using observations and task analysis and trial teaching a lot. Again, the reason why is because it's going to give me some of that detail that I might have missed or have, was missed doing a standardized test, uh, assessment. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, just to kind of give you an example of doing observations is if it's um, actually, actually happened to me, what if my students uh, was doing math and constantly was making the goals meet. So what happened is I gave them the math goal, I mean the math sheet, and I just sat there and watched them do the math. And what happened was the student was just counting wrong on their fingers the entire time, so was getting all of the math problems wrong. So just because I took the time to sit there with them and just analyze every step, I was able to identify this one element that needed to change and be retaught to be successful. Um, again, so all of just Doing some forms of task analysis and observations is going to help out. And then also using other um, methods to maybe do a checklist, to keep a checklist of where they're at is great. And so discrete analysis is very important as well as um, use, utilizing standardized assessments. But if you've noticed your students have the same goals for years, and they, they're not improving. And you notice maybe they're, they're maybe five years behind or you know, they're doing their alphabets in high school. This is the time you're gonna to wanna to consider functional curriculum. Um, functional curriculum doesn't mean you're not following state standards, not even a remote. It, you're still doing state standards, but you're, the curriculum's a bit modified to meet them where they're at, which is very important. Um, again, like doing alphabet in high school might be a little, might have missed that opportune moment. Maybe we need to work on sight words, right? Important words that are gonna get them to where their next level is. <clears throat> so here are some different ways that people have been accessing goals for their students. The goal bank, CECO, Common Core Connectors, and then writing them from scratch. From and before I go any further, I'm going to actually do another poll. I just want to see what everyone's doing out there. And then we'll talk a little bit more about these. And um, again, if you don't do any of this, please feel free to you know, pipe in and say, hi, I'm using this or put in the chat. And part of the reason is to see what other teachers are using, because maybe it's something that we're not aware of yet. Again, we're all, we all are here to help each other and to support each other. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pull up that poll and see what everyone's doing out there. Um, let's see. Oops. No, 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 no. Oh, that's not it. Um, see, there we go. Launch poll. Here we go. So here's the poll. Just checking to see what you guys are using. Just go ahead and click it. Um, Seco Gold Banks from your district from scratch or other. All right, here we go. I'm gonna go ahead and end. All 
I'm going to share the results and give me a thumbs up if y'all can see it out there. Do you see the results? Great. So I'm going to read them. So um, Seco, 5%, Gold Banks, 56%, from scratch is 37%, and the other, and some people put that in chat, what they're using. Um, anyone want to uh, shout out what they might be using that's not on here? No shot. All right. So Gold Banks. All right. So we're going to discuss, whoops, there's the poll, and here we are. So we're going to go ahead and discuss writing the different goal writing approaches. And we, like I said, we have goal bank, SQL, common core connectors, and discrete assessment to standards. The first three I'm going to go over very briefly. And then the third one is the one I'm going to be going over um, more intensively. <clears throat> So here's an image of a goal bank pulled from Los Angeles Unified School District. Just, it's just an image I, I borrowed from them. And what it typically is, you go to their school districts, you choose the area, the standard area that you want, and then you do utilize some discrete assessments to determine what goal you'd like. And then you kind of fill in the blank. Um, hopefully if you're using this method, so I know it is very quick and sometimes we, you know, we have, we have limited time. I'm hoping you're going to be using your discrete assessment to modify this goal as necessary to be individualized. And I mean, I'm saying, you know, showing how is that student going to represent, they understand this standard, this goal and how are they going to access it? So that's part of the part you're going to want to put in that goal to make sure that it's individualized. Otherwise you're just copying and pasting and you don't want to see that our students. We want to make sure it's individualized, you know what the students' access points are, and you understand where they're at. So that is a goal bank. This is Special Education Administrators of County Offices called the CECO. It was developed by a committee of highly experienced California special education professionals. It's been modified three times. The most newest revision was in 2016. And so in 2016, you could see that image right there of the flash drive. That's where it comes in now. Previously, it came in this big, thick binder like this. I'm not sure if anyone has it. But <laughs> previously, it came in a big, thick binder. Um, and what this does, it offers and aligns goals and strategies to the Common Core State Standards for students with extensive support needs. It also provides you with a list of materials, resource, data collection, um, supports to help you develop your IEP. It's a great resource. Um, it does cost roughly a hundred, excuse me, one minute. Hmm. It does cost roughly $150. Um, the information is on the Padlet, but if you are interested in this, please talk to somebody at your district first. Sometimes this is hiding in a closet or a warehouse unknowingly and so it's important to research before you might even want to consider purchasing it just so you're aware. I'm going to show you an image from the CECO and I'm going to kind of walk you through just a, like I said very briefly how to utilize this. You would go ahead and access your standard, I mean your area, and then well first you do your standardized discrete assessment then you go to your subject area find your grade level subject matter, find the anchor standard, and right there's the anchor standard. And then after you find that anchor standard, you find that access point. And the access point on your far left-hand side of that column is going to show you what prompting levels you need, um, or not need, but where does that, what students' prompting supports needed to access that. So how, and how are they going to orient their body to access that material? And so once you find the access point on the far right, you'll see some of the strategies to engage them for that particular goal. Michelle, I had a question. Give me one second. For some reason, my, I could barely hear you. Go ahead. Hi, this is, this is Diane Miller. Uh -huh. um, and so can you use an example, like instead of kindergarten, say sixth grade? Mm -hmm. um, reading standard. So um, 
could I just did you have access to that real quick so I could because that I do not I do not have access for um I have to pull pull up the padlet not the padlet but the actually seco which is on the oh if it's on the padlet then I have that so don't worry yeah so if you go on the padlet I believe the seco actually the seco is not on there um because it does cost money it's not us it's not ours to give out freely oh, and so, okay. yeah so i'm sorry so I, okay i you know what but let me i want to just double check because i want to make sure what i'm saying is accurate obviously um but that from my understanding we do not have the seco on our padlet okay where is let me see give me one second because i want to find it myself here um But so actually the process would be the same though. You would actually find your re the standard you're looking for. <clears throat> and then the access point, the goal, and then the access point. And the access point, you're gonna be finding those details by doing your discrete assessment. Again, what prompting strategy, what communication strategy, um, and also what level of academics you're gonna need to access. One second here. Transition. Yeah, no, unfortunately, it just says um, how to access the Padlet. It doesn't say we do not have it on there. So, no. So, thank you for asking. So, we do not have it on there because it does have fees involved. So, it's not in our liberty to give it to you for free. Um, <laughs> but again, You'll be, but Diane, you'll still be doing exactly what you just saw here. Um, a little bit more in depth. Do your standardize, your discrete assessment, find out what area, uh, subject matter you want it in, and then go ahead and look at your access points. So same thing, but just different grade. Yeah, terrific, thank you. Yeah. All right, so then the next one is our Common Core Connectors. And this was provided by national centers and state collaborative in 2014 to support students with extensive support needs this is for grades 3 through 11 in areas of math reading writing and science um, i do so have to say however it does it is not supported by the u.s department of education so it is not on our padlet but I do know there are teachers that utilize this and I'm going to explain how it is used. As you can see on the image to your left, um, Common Core State Standards. So right of it is Common Core Connectors, the CCC. And what it does is it breaks that standard down to something that's a little bit more pr practical and practical for our students. And that's more accessible. And so on the right hand side is essential understanding to understand the essence of what we're trying to learn through that standard. And that's called the Common Core Connectors. Does anyone, before we move on, does anyone have any questions so far? And you could go ahead and put it in chat or kind of hit that space bar. All right, we're going to move forward. So now we're going to go ahead and move forward to just writing them from scratch. And it sounds a lot of people are, some of you are doing this as well. And we're going to focus on being defensible, triangulating our goals, um, utilizing the SMART method, and then also applying that to Common Core State Standards. <clears throat> and I'm just going to elaborate a little bit of reasons why you want them to be defensible. Um, part of it is to make sure if, if you go to court, you can say, oh, yeah, I, I did my due diligence and I know my student. I got their baselines and this is representable. And utilizing that SMART method is going to make sure that it's defensible. And we're going to go into a lot of detail about that today. And we can write and apply common course that stands to meaningful, functional, foundational, independent goals and curriculum. 
So today we'll be reviewing some steps in connecting our students to standards and goals. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, somebody, I just looked at chat. Can you repeat what you said about the US? So the Common Core State Standards, what I, I read is that it's not um, supported by the department. So I'm just letting you know that. I know people are using them, but if you do use them, I would actually reference both the standard and the Common Core connector. <clears throat> So how we're going to understand the, the standards? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to determine how to read the standard. And then we determine the essence of the standard and determine them, um, allow our students to demonstrate their knowledge of the goals. And I just want to emphasize, typically what you're going to want to do is write your goals first. But today, I want you to have a framework of understanding that standard so you feel it's a little bit more manageable, a little bit more practical, and there's that, aha, oh, I get it. So then once we write that goal, we go back to the standard and go, this is easy peasy, right? And so that's what we want to see is set up that framework so we're understanding how to read that standard. So once we re write the goal, you'll understand, oh, okay, there's a standard. It makes perfect sense now. It's, that's what we're working on today. <clears throat> So we're going to use Bloom's taxonomy to, dem to demystify the standards, again, by reading the goal, like learning how to read the goal, learning how to read the essence of the goal by being very specific. You want to understand how to be specific in that goal, and then also connecting the goal with our students to allow them to demonstrate their knowledge. because we wanna make sure that goal is attainable for them. So, because the goal is theirs, right? It's individual. We make sure that we're, whatever we're writing is attainable by that student. So this is Bloom's taxonomy. So the image you're seeing here was created by Benjamin in 1956. There's a classification of learning outcomes and objectives. As you can see, it's a pyramid approach. So as it goes up from bottom to top, it increases in cognitive load for students, for people. So at the bottom, as you could see, it says remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, and create. So remembering would be more like recall facts and basic concepts. To create takes a lot more cognitive load because you're going to have to remember, recall, and apply. So that's higher cognitive load as you go further up on this Bloom's attack taxonomy, excuse me. So in that verb you see in that pyramid is changeable. So we're not stuck in just saying, oh, apply. I need you to apply your knowledge. What you could use is change that verb. And all, all of a sudden, you're going to say demonstrate, interpret. These are other verbs that you can use to understand how to apply. We're going to move forward. I'm going to go a little bit more in depth here. So breaking down the verb levels of learning objectives by what you want to gain from the students. So for instance, remember the pyramid? So the bottom one was recall, I think it was recall. So what we would want to do is what type of questions can we incite that elicit that response from our students? So we're going to think of different questions to ask them, right? So can the student recall or remember information? And that verb can change and say, well, can they repeat Right? So maybe they can't recall, but can they repeat it? So maybe they just need to be modeled and then they're going to be able to repeat that. Right. And so there's so we're going to move up Bloom's taxonomy as it increases, like the, last, the top of the pyramid is creating. So that verb creating can change into design, develop, formulate, depending on what level your students at and what right and the questions you would try to elicit a response with can the student create new products or points of view so it's thinking kind of outside the box to get them to respond and to meet them where they're at so we're going to might seem a little vague so we're going to go ahead and do this step by step together so this what you're seeing here is a common core state standard grade one 
for literacy. Ask and answer questions about key details in a text. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna break the verb down, which is the Bloom's taxonomy, right? How do we break that verb down? Ask and answer text. What, can, what else, what other verb can we replace that with? We could I, identify, retell, right? You gotta think of your student and where they're at. So here are some examples. Repeat, memorize, restate, list. All right, that's, that's manageable when you start thinking of it like outside of the box. So now that we understand ask and answer questions about key details in a text, it's still to me, the standard seems really vague, right? I, it's manageable because I, I have identified a different terminology besides ask and answer questions. But text to me, I can think of paragraphs, I can think of journals, and I'm like, it's, it's I, can't grasp that for my students level. But if you really think about text, here's a list of different options for text, right? You've got pictures, personal information, schedules, recipes, icons. Text could be many different things, right? So now that we think of that same standard, right? Ask and answer questions about key details in the text. But that aha, oh, I get it now. That's that definitely accessible for my students. That that standard works for my students. You can also incorporate it with ELD. Right, actually, yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. So we now that the goal is practical for us, we understand it, but when we write our goals, we need to make sure our students can demonstrate their knowledge, right? We need to figure out how are they gonna demonstrate their knowledge? And so there's different levels of demonstrating knowledge. They can recall, they can make decisions, they can be abstract information to plan. Um, they could do high level thinking of planning and applying, right? There's lots of different thing, ways. Um, so here's depth of knowledge. It is a framework to identify the level of rigor a student needs to assess access for a lesson. It was developed in 1997 by Dr. Norman Webb. Again, it's to categorize activities according to the level of complexity and thinking, so their rigor, internal rigor that they're, they're undergoing to access the curriculum. And there are four levels. And somebody has their hand up. Um, I, somebody had their quite a hand up. If you wanted to, go, I could stop for a minute and. Yes, sorry, um, Michelle. Yeah. So, is your understanding when it comes to like um, blues taxonomy? Sorry, blooms. I said blues. Flashback. Blooms. Blues. Blues. Uh, so, blooms taxonomy. If you think about specific, like a grade level, you can find even that evaluating and creating level in even kindergarten right it's just like at their level so they would be creating drawings and evaluating simpler text but you can still get that it's not like split off only high schoolers can do that evaluating and creating right and i'm glad you bring that up and that's pretty critical and the reason why is because if you only ask the kindergarten to recall they're not they're not going to manifest everything they need to to be Become a very thoughtful, progressive person, right? Because you do need to create as a kindergarten, right? All of those elements are in every aspect of education, and they should be applied in every aspect of, of every, excuse me, of every hmm, education. <laughs> thank you. So thank you, Michelle, for bringing that up. Yes. Okay, all the way up. You use all of all of those strategies. And if you go to um, like Universal to UDL, um, some of one of our colleagues will be doing a presentation on UDL. They actually discuss the strategies you need to apply for students to be most successful. So the, sorry. So the depth of knowledge, again, is the four, four types of rigor that a student is going to undergo in thinking for accessing the material. So like with Michelle, the blooms is for the standard, right? So initially we're speaking of the standard. How are we going to think about that standard so we can apply it to the goal, right? How they connect. But now we're talking about the goal, right? And how is the student going to 
process the knowledge, right? This is the depth of knowledge. How are they going to show you they know? And that's part of our discrete analysis as well. Is we need to make sure that how can they tell us they know, right? We need we got we have to do the assessment to figure that part out. <clears throat> so again, is we we've got the four levels of depth of knowledge. <clears throat> Recall and reproduce. Level two is basic reasoning. Three is strategic thinking. Four is extended thinking. And then, again, just like with Blooms, this one has questions to elicit responses, right? So level one, recall and reproduce. You might ask them, where did they go? Well, what did, you know? So there's different levels of questions you're going to ask to elicit responses. So, for instance, level four would be extended thinking. So you're going to maybe ask them, how do they feel about something? Um, what is the relationship to something? Um, some examples that I had <clears throat> is when did you go to the ocean? You know, very, level one, right? Well, um, what would you do, have done if you couldn't have used a car to get to the ocean? Wow, that's a complex sentence, right? You've got to think about what if that's very abstract at this point so that's probably you know level three strategic thinking i have to think about what would you know and visualize that so again you have to think about the rigor that's involved in answering questions and accessing the information so this is going to be a little video that explains the difference between bloom's taxonomy and the depths of knowledge Give me one second. And it's about three minutes. I think it's like three minutes. And let me know if you all could see it with a thumbs up. I haven't started playing it yet. <laughs> Bloom's taxonomy versus what? Waiters always look at me. Oops, and give me I'm going to have a little salad. Mm -hmm. Sorry and about that. And when I do my webs. Yep. Okay, sorry, knowledge. thumbs up if you could see it. Awesome, Bloom's thanks for participating. It was developed by Benjamin Bloom in 1956 and revised by Lauren Anderson in 2000. Webb's depth of knowledge was developed by Norman Webb in 1997. Norman Webb was a research scientist who came up with the depth of knowledge system. So what is Bloom's taxonomy? Well, it's a framework for classifying learning based on different levels of cognition. Webb's depth of knowledge, on the other hand, is a model to analyze how deep students must think. So to summarize, Bloom's taxonomy is used to classify learning on levels of cognitive complexity, and Webb's depth is used to analyze how deep students think. The levels of Bloom's taxonomy are usually presented in a triangle with higher cognitive processes on top. The levels are creating, evaluating, analyzing, applying, understanding, and remembering. On the other hand, Webb's depth of knowledge is presented through a four-level circle. The level includes recall, skills, strategic thinking, and lastly, extended thinking. Now, Bloom's taxonomy was created with a purpose for educators. It is intended to be used to write learning objectives for tasks. Webb's depth of knowledge, on the other hand, aims to evaluate thinking process. It is used to examine how deep a student learns the material. <clears throat> Bloom's taxonomy specifically focuses on verbs to classify levels of thinking. The taxonomy offers verb tables that are said to correlate with various levels of the taxonomy. Webb's does not focus on verbs, but rather focuses on the process of thinking. With Webb's, teachers should look to identify the type of thinking going, so going on inside the student's head you will notice that Bloom's taxonomy is leveled with steps. Bloom's taxonomy is a hierarchy with higher thinking levels on top. Webb's depth of knowledge is not a hierarchy, but rather a detail of different ways students think. 
or rather just a description of the thinking process. To reiterate, Bloom's is a taxonomy and Webb's instead is more of a description. Right now, I just want to say thank you for your time. I hope that helped kind of visualize it for everybody to see the difference between the two. Um, I think it was a, a great visual reference. I like that. <laughs> All right, so we're going to move forward. And this is just a nice quote I have from M. Knowledge is of no value unless you put it into practice. I believe in hands-on practice. And so that's why I have that on there. And so now we're going to spend some time analyzing standards to break them down to be a little bit more palatable. So this is a standard that we've already spoken about. Ask and answer questions recite from a text recipe. Well, answer and answer, ask and answer questions from a text. So I revised it so it was palatable for my class to you know wrap my head around it, right? So I I have here is vegetarian beans and rice recipe. And I have both visual pictorial and written words. And again, the standard, I've broken it down for myself. I've changed the verb. Instead of ask and answer questions, they're going to recite. And text, I broke it down for myself. I'm gonna use a recipe. And I know that the print here is very small. The next slide is gonna be a little bit large. I'm gonna discuss it a little bit further because we wanna access our students' knowledge. So we want to apply depth of knowledge to the goal. So you want to emphasize the four levels, depth of knowledge, and types of questions that we're going to ask to draw, elicit those responses, right? So we could recall and reproduce basic reasoning, strategic thinking, or extended thinking, our four different levels. So now we're thinking about the goal for their student, right? So the standards done, but now what about the goals for our students? So the complexity, a uh, level of complexity changes one to four. So some of the questions that I have there to draw out some knowledge from our students, um, recall information, just how much rice do you add? So that would be just, you know, looking at it. <clears throat> um, a little bit deeper of a question is explain what happens to uncooked rice. Right now, you've got a lot more thinking involved, justification. And then maybe last, you know, have a student create their own recipe, right? That's extended thinking aspect of a goal. The bottom portion of this image is how to respond to questions. And this is, this is an everyday of how is our student going to access the curriculum. So one is rigor of your mind, right? How are they going to access it? The next one is how are they going to respond? verbally, um, with AAC device, gestures. Um, there's different ways a student's going to respond. And you know your students, and those are, the, those are the parts that you're going to need to put in that goal, is how are they going to respond to this um, goal. So we have rigor, and then we have how they're responding. Pointing, touching, gesturing, um, computer, AAC device. So those are all the things that you're going to use. And throughout the presentation, I'll give you different ideas as well as, as how to respond. Um, so this one is Common Core State Standard, grade six. This is a language arts. Again, we want to find the verb and the essence of the standard, right? And I highlighted here the um, verb analyze and with the essence structure of a text. So we need to analyze figure out what the verb is, because analyze seems a little um, vague, right? So I need to, to narrow in on what that would look like. <clears throat> analyze, OK, explain, compare, right? That's manageable, right? It's practical, explain and compare. Now, text, again, text is many different items. Um, again, you've got to open up our minds and think of what this could look like for our students. Um, transportation schedules, catalogs, magazines. Um, actually, I know there's comics are a, a big fad right now for students is reading comics. Um, 
So again, we're, we're opening up that standard and thinking kind of outside the box. So the purpose for this workshop, I actually am using a bar schedule for text. Um, you know, definitely for your, your home area, use your bus stations, you can do anything. Again, this is very open. Um, so analyze structure of text. I'm gonna examine the structure of a bar schedule, right? So I'm, I'm identifying the verb, I've changed it to feel a little bit more practical and useful for me and, my, and what I'm doing. Um, and I'm finding something that's motivating for my students because we wanna motivate our students because if they're motivated, they're gonna get engaged and they're gonna participate. And we want that because if they're getting engaged and participating, we're gonna be learning and we want that. We want them to learn, apply, retain, right? And so that's it's part of the motivation. thought of using a bus schedule. I'm saying again for me, it's been a long time. <laughs> I said, I like this because I do seventh and eighth grade. I would never have thought of using a bus schedule. Yeah. Or Metro, this is great. Yeah, it's great because actually um, you could do, I mean, it, this, this is many lessons all in one. Um, I just, I, I love it because you could actually have them reading the bus schedule, planning a trip, and it goes back to your four different levels, right? So you're going to match, compare, investigate. Um, are you going to recall skills? What strategic planning are you going to have? What extended thinking are you going to have? But it and also so incorporates some of the um, vocational skills about organization and using executive functions. Exactly. Thank you. So, I mean, again, you've got the level of rigor is amazing. You could have one, one classroom and you could hit different levels depending on your students' needs. So you could keep your, the standard stays the same, the goal adapts per student based on their needs and their level of rigor. Um, like I said, we could have one student doing level four. He's, they are ex, um, creating the trip, maybe to, a, to um, some place, <laughs> hometown, to a restaurant, to a museum, right? Um, right. Or, and virtually you could ask them, okay, why, why don't you plan a trip to school, how how do you get to school by the bus? You know, so there's so many different smart, options. It's a smart goal, and 21st century skills wants us teaching the kids how to use technology, so they could even look up the schedules. Right, yep. and actually, there's apps for that. <laughs> that yeah. Actually, help you out with that, definitely. <laughs> All right, and so then, so the depths of not of knowledge. Some of those questions you're going to ask you, you know, where is the city you want to go to? Um, what train do you use? Is it this, a, and then on a level one, is this a bar or, I mean, is this bar or train or bus? Again, what level do you need to meet the student where they're at? In some ways, the students can respond is by pointing, touching, you know, picking out pictures, verbally responding, lots of different options, using flashcards to choose. So we're getting a little bit uh, deeper into our standards here. This is grade four for a math, Mathematic practice and this and the standard is no relative size of measurement unit. Hmm. Well, we got to change that verb to be a little bit more palatable, right? And we need to understand the essence of the goal by being very specific to help us um, see how it applies to our students. So to know again. Remember, recite list. All right. Now, what about measurement? Here we have a variety of different measurements that we can use. Small, medium, large, long, short, hour, minute. So we're meeting the student at their level and making sure the, the standard is manageable for us and the goal. So here we go, no measurement. Again, I, I hit the motivation aspect. I chose something that's very popular, which is Starbucks. Um, I think that's pretty motivating. And again, you could choose um, a location in your home vicinity. Um, Starbucks is pretty popular over here. <clears throat> and also it's very functional and relevant um, because they don't have to drink coffee to go to Starbucks. They have sandwiches, smoothies, fruit. Um, pastries, they have everything now. <laughs> All right, so back again. So depth of knowledge, how are they gonna show us they know what we're talking, what we're trying to teach, right? Got your four levels of access points for rigor, right? 
How are they gonna show you they know the information we're at, right? Um, again, you know, recall, making decisions, strategic thinking, extended thinking, right? So let's do um, recall and reproduce, just match the size of drinking drinks. You could do a cup to cup match, right? You could label them or you could just do words. Here's small, right? And then where's a small cup and you're matching, right? You just break it down and meet them where they're at. <clears throat> Um, because again, you could just do matching or you can do reading with this. This is also reading vocabulary, right? And if you go up even further, you could actually have them do, how long do you want to wait for your drink, right? So let's think about that because now that's complex and abstract time. So again, you know, what level of rigor do you, can we access? And again, how are we gonna have our students responding to this? Again, I was saying you could do written, you could do matching, Verbal response, um, you could load up information into their phone and show, right? Show it to um, the clerk to order or order online an app, right? And go pick it up. There's a lot, a lot of skills involved with that. Um, so now this one is, what time are we at? So we are at grade 11, 12, and we're going to look at the essence. I'm going to speed it up a lot so we can get everything in today. Um, let's see, I'm not reading this whole standard, <laughs> but it's grade 11, 12, you can go into the manual and read it, but what we're going to extract from it again is the verb and the essence, right? Because this is a lot of verbiage. And again, we want to make sure that it's practical and applicable. So here we have narry effective techniques. So that's what I pulled out of that standard, right? That big standard. So what it's saying is we need to narrate with effective techniques. We're going to want to make sure that it is manageable for us. So I'm going to sh say sharing personal information, preferences, strengths, needs, retail, and events. Right? So now I feel like this is a more accessible for my students. And this goal, I, I, could, I could write. And they're going to convey this information in a way that the audience is going to access. Michelle, this is the goal that my students and I and my gen ed teachers, we struggle with. Right. <laughs> well, I'm going to give you some examples right next. Great. Okay. Again, you know, you're going to, you know your students, you know what your curriculum is. Here we go. So narrate using effective techniques. I had changed this to um, peanut butter jelly sandwiches. <laughs> so, right, we're going to describe, right? A lesson, which is the peanut butter jelly sandwich. All right, we're gonna break it down to the four areas. And I went ahead and I, I gave you some of how you're going to have them access. And so what I put on this one is a little bit different than I had on the others for depth of knowledge. So how are they gonna access the information? They could create a story, they could sequence an event, um, identify the first and last part of a story. And I'm actually going to go a little bit further in this next slide. And I want to explain why I have two pictures here. Um, so classrooms are full of a varying of students. And it is our job to meet the, those needs. And so we could have the same standard, change the goal, right? Same curriculum. But each student, we want to meet them where they're at. So we might have a student that is working with pictures and sequencing. Another student is actually writing and learning sequencing through first, next, last, right? So you can have the same classroom, different um, objectives, right? So for instance, person doing the sequencing of the sandwiches, they have to sequence it or match sequencing it. Um, a person with this, the sentence structure, they're gonna write the steps. So it's the same standard, the goal has been changed, the access point, their depth of knowledge changed, but the curriculum, I mean, what that, what you're doing in the classroom is the same. We're making sandwiches. <laughs> All right, so we've got about how much? 2.30. How, how long are we with together? Till 2.30? Yes, excellent. I see some head shaking. Thank you. So I'm going to kind of move forward and we're going to put all of that together. So again, I wanted to give you the framework to analyze those standards 
right? So that way, when you get to them, they're not they're they're not so abstract any longer, and they're they're applicable to what we're doing. <clears throat> so we're gonna go ahead and pull it all together and we'll start writing that goal. We want to have when, who, will do what, at what level of, of proficiency and in, under what condition. So I went through a lot of depth of knowledge, which is how are they gonna show um, their know, right? And what type of rigor they're gonna access, right? That's that part, the will do what. <clears throat> and then the measurement part is important as well because we wanna make sure those students are going to, they're going to master what we're teaching. We wanna be able, we could, measure if they've learned it and mastered it. And some of that is on the data, but you're also gonna need to know what condition you're gonna access it. So I know it sounds a little crazy, but it's okay. So depth of knowledge, we're gonna, we're gonna walk it through, we've got 30 minutes. Um, I'm gonna give an example just real quickly. Um, so remember, Discrete analysis, standardized, we want our baseline. We need our baseline first because we want to make sure our goal is close to that baseline because we want to make sure it's relevant and attainable within our time span. Is it a year? Is it six months, right? So for instance, um, I'm going to use an arbitrary name. Tammy can read numbers and count up to 10, has one-to-one -one correspondence up to 10. Now the goal is that was the baseline, what she can do. Now, Tammy will count out and hand to staff correct dollar amount when provided with 10 single dollars when requested verbally and visually with 90% accuracy in two consecutive weeks. So I was able to tell you the baseline, who, depth of knowledge, how is she going to show me, right? And under what conditions, I mean, and um, sorry, how I'm going to measure and then under what conditions to Right, and so that's what we want with all of our goals, and we're going to walk through that right now. And I want to see if you remember what the <clears throat> SMART acronym means. So we're going to launch this poll. If you remember what the SMART acronym means. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end polling so we can move forward. And everyone, 100%. Great job. All right. <clears throat> this is just to recap, and this is your 100%. Everyone got that correct. Great. All right, align goals to standards. Don't overthink it, don't overcomplicate it. Again, the standard, just find the essence, right? Change that verb. And then the goal, through how are they going to show you they understand? <clears throat> so we want to make sure you're prioritizing, do your discrete analysis, determine the foundation, functional, and independent skills that are most relevant to the next step. Write the goal, use a smart approach, triangulate them, and align the goals to the standards. And remember, not every IEP goal needs to be tied directly to the standard grade level standards. So as long as one goal is tied to the grade level, then you could choose another option on your form. So here's an SE's form. It has four different options, enable students to progress in general education, addressing other needs, linguistically appropriate, and transition. So depending on the students and their needs, you can choose um, a different box but at least one needs to be tied to a grade level standard. 
So we're gonna do a case study right now together. I'm gonna to walk through it from beginning all the way to writing the goal. <clears throat> so this is Amber. She is grade five. She's on autism spectrum disorder and intellectual disability. We did our standard assessment, the general, um, the adaptive behavior assessment. I'm gonna just explain it just a little bit so you have a little bit of background or an understanding of this part. Um, so the adaptive behavioral assessment system, the ABAS, and what that is, is a general adaptive composite summary for adaptive skills in 11 different areas, such as community, communication, um, academics, and she did score low. That was the six. And then the Kaufman assessment battery for children, they and that um, assess for cognitive processing ability. So just understanding that. And that is a nonverbal index of 57. The Brigance is academics, and it shows that she's at kindergarten level and first grade level math. And the reason I just wanted to go over that is because this is going to give you some information about the student, but you might find, oh, it's not enough information to know what is the next step, what is the next goal, right? So this is some of the, the information that was extracted from those particular standardized norm reference tests. Her, uh, her strengths and weaknesses, she's a visual learner, she follows one-step directions, struggles with abstract. Um, Again, this is all great information, but for me, I would need to do some discrete analysis to determine what is the next step. And so some of the discrete analysis that I would choose would be trial teaching, observation, and through that, those discrete assessments, we've noticed we've gained some more information, a lot more detail, right? And that detail is gonna guide us to what is the next step for her to be successful or you know, found, get her foundational skills. So we're going to prioritize and we're going to align the goal. Here are her areas of need and her weak areas. So we're going to determine the goal area. Um, again, so we've all looked at the, the standardized assessment, the discrete assessment, and based on the area goal that you're choosing, math, reading, writing, you know, you're going to choose that goal for the purpose of this particular workshop, we're choosing functional sight words. Um, again, I find that to be very um, functional because it creates independence because everything in the world is pretty much in some form of writing, pictorial form. So it'll be helpful in all areas of her life. So we're going to do functional sight word reading in the baseline. As we already know, Amber can read a few sight words and has demonstrated increased understanding with visuals. So that means we can pair her words and her visuals together, and that's going to support her. And we want to make sure that it is a SMART goal. It's specific. What is her prompt level, right? What's her level of Depth of knowledge, is she going to recite, recall, apply, or, gener or generate new information? Measurable, we want to make sure she's going to be able to master it. What does she need to master the skill? Is it attainable? So again, is this an attainable goal? Based on her baseline, we've got to create a goal that's going to be close up. We don't want to expect her to read a paragraph right now, right? Because right now she's just learning a few sight words and visuals, so she's not reading a paragraph. And we want to make sure it's relevant. So make sure it's a pivotal skill, it's foundational skill, and it can be applied um, triangulated and time-based. When are we going to want to do it? So here's the goal that we have. <clears throat> so she'll read her daily schedule consisting of both pictures and words and transition independently to the next activity with no more than one prompt. And that's all the information you gathered, right, from her depth of knowledge, antecedents, I mean, um, discrete analysis. And proficiency level is six out of eight opportunities for three consecutive weeks. Again, you wanna make sure she, the person is mastering the skill. So you wanna make sure she's doing, you're getting the data. It's not like two days she did it successfully, she's got it. No, you need a couple of weeks. We need to see that she's mastered it and she can apply that information. And here she has it in two different settings. 
And again, you want to make sure that you're describing where you want it done because they might meet the goal, but you never specified when. So for instance, um, I think I've seen a goal for their backpack, put their backpack away. And um, they never said when. So the student never met the goal because they didn't specify when. In the morning, they put it away, but not in the afternoon or after lunch. But that means you need to be very clear about your data. How are you collecting your data? And specifying when. <clears throat> this is a, a, the goal written out in the paragraph form. And we're going to just double check with our SMART goal. It is very specific because it follows her reading that she's going to have a visual and a written schedule. It is measurable. It's attainable, right? Because it's close to her baseline. It has all the same supports. We just want to overextend periods. It is time-based because we only want it in two different situations. It is relevant because we all use schedules in different forms. So it's not like we're asking her to, I don't know, do something that's not appropriate or age bound. It's very appropriate because we all do have schedules that they might be written, they might be on your phone, but we all have schedules that we follow. So common core state standard, this is what would be pulled out. Should be reading informational text. Grade five. And again, so we're looking at standard, right? Reading informational text, the text is her schedule, the reading is the pictorial in her words. And so that would be the standard. This is what it would actually look like in your manual. It looks a little overwhelming, but it is there. <laughs> and please remember if you don't, not, if a student's not making progress, change the goal. Take more discrete analysis, be realistic. Um, maybe this, the student needs accommodations, not goals. So sometimes during that discrete analysis, instead of writing a goal for that student, all you really need to do is provide the accommodations and you put that on the IEP, some, maybe some visual supports, um, something so that you need to understand the difference between the two. So this discrete analysis will provide that. And making sure that everything is attainable and relevant for that student is very important. And always think of why are you writing that goal? What, what is it providing that student a foundational functional skill? Right, so make sure that you think of the why. Why are we doing this? What is it, what, what's it in it for them, right? And we're gonna have a little bit of quiz. We've got a little bit of time left. <clears throat> And all right, so I'm going to throw a question out there and then you're going to ask. It's about the SMART goal. So we've got three questions regarding the SMART goal. And there it's up. Which SMART goal method six out of eight opportunities for three consecutive weeks as measured by teacher tracked data? Which one is it? A specific, attainable, measurable, or relevant? All right, we're still getting some numbers coming in. <clears throat> All right, we're going to end the poll and move on for the sake of time for everybody. We've got a couple more trickling in. And it is measurable. It's a measurable goal, six out of eight opportunities. So how, what is the percentage that you want them to get it correct? Excellent. 
stop share. Got it. All right, next one, guys. This is a true or false. It is relevant that all students learn how to count coins. And don't think just about kindergartens. Think about all the way up to high school and those adults. Should they be counting coins? And we have one more question after this, and then I'm going to give you, um, I'll be providing a survey. And when you do the survey, it'll link to a certificate for the day, a fill-in certificate for the day. All right, so false. It is not relevant. If you are a high school student in 11th grade and you're still counting coins penny by penny, you're, it's not a valuable skill set at this point. You should be learning dollar up systems, counting dollars if possible to access things. Um, so yes, counting coins is an important skill, but there's a point in time when if you're gonna utilize time at school in your memory, start doing dollar up systems. So you're learning how to count dollars, one, two, three, four, five. Um, so just trying to think again outside the box and when is it time to, okay, let's do something different. That if they've been on this goal for five, 10 years trying to count coins, it's time to change it, right? Gotta change that goal. Okay, oops, share the results and stop share. And last one, and then I'm gonna put in the um, chat The survey and so which smart goal will turn one page at a time of a book from right to left one gestured wrong. Again, I appreciate all of you being here today. I'm glad I'm here. Feel free to email. My email will be at the end of this. Um, in the chat, you'll find the link to the survey as well as once you fill that survey out, it will generate a link to the certificate and it is a fill-in, so you'll put your name in it and print it. So um, I'm getting noticed that the link's not working. So give me a chance to access it, to give to you. I'm gonna end the poll. And so that particular goal, as you can see, it is a specific part of the goal. So turn one page at a time. So again, this is the depth of knowledge. How are they gonna show understanding? They need prompts. They're gonna be turning it one from left to right. So it's very specific. Excellent. So give me a moment and so I could see why this link isn't working because I would definitely want you to have this link. Uh, 
as I'm looking, there is a quote. There we go. So it's dating license required to print it. Give me, thank you. I am, let's see. Let me know if this one works. Um, I just sent in. I'm getting advice from my colleagues on chat, so I am very appreciative of them right now. And here are some links for the, the other breakouts this week. And I'm looking for that link for everybody right now, see what I can do. Um, did the previous link work or no? It still said no. It said no for me and it take, kept taking me to my college, <laughs> not here. Okay. Yeah, mine's asking for a Microsoft account. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you for guys for commenting so that way I know where I'm at. I am still looking to access it. We had the same problem yesterday and she had to email it to us separately. I didn't even get the email from yesterday's. Thank you for your patience, I appreciate it. Um, I see there's a new form online. Joey, is that one? Um, oh, that's, is that accessible? Again? Yeah, that one I just posted should be accessible to everyone. Go ahead and try that one. Thank you, Joey. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in, but I'm trying to figure out where to access it again. Yeah. Yeah, it, I was it, able, it, I was able to open Joey's link. So oh, thank great. You. I get, yeah. I see somebody, Desiree gave us a thumbs up so that, Thank you, Joey. Awesome. No problem. And if anybody was at my training yesterday, um, I can email you the link from yesterday's and I'll put my email in the chat again. Oh, okay. Can you send it to me? Yeah, I'll put it in the chat right now. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you everyone again for being here today and investing in yourself and your students. And I appreciate it. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to email. And on what you're seeing now is the Zoom links for the rest of the week. We've got some tomorrow. We've got goal running and executive functioning. Then Thursday's data design and collection and Friday is secondary transition. And I'll be on for a couple minutes if you want to address any questions. Otherwise, thank you again and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you, it was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you again, Michelle. You were awesome. Oh, I appreciate the feedback. Everyone likes feedback, so thank you. <laughs> Very time it. efficient. Thank you. Thank you.